QuickBooks Online 2024 Other Forms. Get ready because we're going to Bookkeeping Cloud 9 with QuickBooks Online. Here we are online in our browser searching for QuickBooks Online Test Drive. Looking for the result that has Intuit.com and the URL. Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks. Selecting the United States version of the software and verifying that we're not a robot. Opening up our major financial statement reports like we do every time. Reports on the left-hand side. We're in the favorites, right-clicking on the balance sheet. Open link in new tab. Right-click on the profit and loss. Open link in the new tab. Let's take a look at those tabs. Up top, we're going to close the hamburger on this middle tab. There's our balance sheet. Tab into the right, closing the hamburger. There's our profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement. Let's go to the first tab. That's the setup process that we do every time. We're going to do our data input here in the first tab. Look at the results on the end result financial statements on the tabs to the right. Selecting the drop down. In prior presentations, we've been thinking about our cycles. We looked at the full accounting cycle we want to keep in mind. And then we're looking at the cycles within the cycles. We started with the vendor cycle, vendors for purposes of QuickBooks being a specific term on one side of the table, being that we're sending money out at the end of the cycle, generally, in order to be purchasing goods and services. We also looked at the customer cycle, where from a QuickBooks perspective, that means that the customers are going to be paying us money ultimately coming in from the cycle for goods and services that we provide. Remembering though, that the term customer and vendor could also be applied to us. So we are our vendors customers and uh, we, we are vendors to you know our customers. So but we want to keep the term straight in terms of what it means for QuickBooks. First a word from our sponsor. Yeah actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product, because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com as well as have the more expanded terms so we can understand what's going on from each side of the table when we're not when we're talking to people that aren't using QuickBooks terminology. And then we talked we, we're going to look later we also have the employee cycle. The employee cycle is an issue or in and of itself, a specialty in and of itself, because there's a lot of laws that go related to the employee cycle. And there's often going to be taxes, payroll taxes that we have to deal with, with the employee cycle. So we'll touch on the employee cycle. But remember, the employee cycle could take a whole uh, course in and of itself. And there's the question as to whether we're going to be doing the payroll within the QuickBooks system or whether we do the payroll with a third party provider, in which case the question is, how will we then get that information into the financial statements for financial reporting? So we'll touch on that stuff uh, in future presentations. But the bottom line is the employee cycle similar to the vendor cycle. It would be as easy as the vendor cycle, just a part of the vendor cycle, if it wasn't for all the rules, regulations, and taxes with the employee cycle. In other words, where money is going out at the end of the day for the purchase of services of the employees. Now let's take a look at this other one over here. Now what is going on over here? Is this a cycle? Not really, right? These are forms that didn't really fit in these other cycles. So remember the general idea here is 
the stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, we wanna do with the use of a form because the forms are designed to help us track uh, the, the activity, both in terms of recording it to the financial statement and in terms of being able to track by customer, by vendor, and by employee in our centers over here, the sales center or customer center, expenses center or vendor center, and the payroll center or the employee center. So we wanna make sure that we're using these forms uh, whenever possible. The plus button is where QuickBooks houses the forms that are used on a day-to-day -day basis, or at least are used periodically, are used often and repeatedly. So any transaction that is cyclical, that happens all the time, you would expect there to be some kind of form that has been set up for it, so the data input can be easier and we can track it in the related centers. Any transaction or transactions that are, or types of things within QuickBooks that are designed for the initial setup process, you'll recall was in the cog up top and under the lists primarily. This is where you have a lot of the underlying foundational things that have to be set up before you do the normal kind of accounting processes. I'm gonna go back to the dashboard. So then the question is, well, these others over here must then be things that possibly happen periodically. They happen quite often on a cyclical basis possibly, but didn't quite fit in any of the cycles, customers, vendor, or employee cycle. So these are the odd ones out that we use all the time, but don't really fit in any particular cycle. I'll talk about them just briefly here, and then we'll go into some of them in more detail in future presentations. First, we have the bank deposit. Now, we already talked about the bank deposit, and we said that we, it, we talked about it within the customer cycle, which is where it fits most easily because most of the time deposits or increases to our checking account should be the ultimate thing that happens at the end of the customer cycle, whether we have a cash-based system or whether it's an accrual-based system, you should end off with a deposit. But I believe they put it over here, possibly in part because that's where it was always way back from the desktop version and so on. But you could also get deposits from people other than the customers. So what, what other deposits might you get from then, then from customers? You might have a deposit from you, the owner, which would typically happen when you're creating a new business or when you're expanding the business, in which case you wanna make sure you don't record it as income. And you might have a deposit that comes from a loan. That's the other way you might finance the business, in which case you don't wanna record it to income. You wanna make sure that you record it to a, uh, a liability account. So we talked about that in the past. Then we have a transfer form. So the transfer form is a little bit tricky to understand. We'll talk about it more later and we'll also dive into it possibly when we get into the bank feed. So the reason it's a little bit tricky is because when we think of a transfer, we're thinking about a transfer between two financial related accounts. It's like bank accounts, but it could also be credit card accounts. So in other words, if you're going from your, your checking account to your savings account, then you would typically use a transfer form. So why, why isn't that straightforward? Well, you, if you think about it, you could use an expense form or a check form because it's coming, if it's coming out of your checking account and going into the savings account, I can record an expense form in the checking account and then just make it go into the, into the savings account or a check form. Why don't I do that? Why, would, why do I need a transfer form then? Well, if you did it that way, then it would look fine on, on the checking account side, but on the other side of the transaction in the savings account, you would have an expense type form which is actually increasing an account. So that would look funny, right? So if I went over here and I went into my savings account and, and I saw that it wasn't a deposit, but a check form that was increasing my savings account, that would look weird because I would think that in the checking accounts, expense form should be decreasing my checking account, right? So it would look fine in the checking account, but it would look funny on the savings account side. Or you could say, well, I could use, I could use a deposit form. I could go into my savings account and use a deposit form. Well, what would happen if I did that, then that would look good on the savings account side because it would look like a deposit. But if I look at the detail in the checking account side, 
then I would have a deposit form that would be a negative, which would be funny looking. So that's why the transfer form is a form that could be an increase or a decrease and doesn't look really funny on either side. So we'll talk more about that in the future. And then we've got the journal entry. If you're an accountant that learned accounting in a school system before jumping into QuickBooks software or any kind of accounting software, you might have a tendency to want to think of everything in journal entries format, meaning debits and credit format. Uh, you have to resist that in that you have to make sure that you apply your journal entry knowledge to each of the forms. You need to know what each of the forms are doing from a journal entry perspective. That will help you. If you try to just go straight to the journal entry without using the forms, that's going to cause you a problem because you're not going to be properly tracking the flow from a bookkeeping perspective through the centers, the customer vendor and employee centers. So therefore, what's the general process? You want to ask if a transaction has a form related to it. If it does, use the form to record the transaction, which will record a debit and a credit, which is in essence a journal entry. If there's not a form to record a transaction to, then I would ask, is the checking account affected? Because if the checking account is affected, then you might be able to record it with a deposit form or a check form or to the check register, which again would be using a form. If cash is affected, you would think you could probably use a form. If there's no form that's being used and cash isn't affected, then and only then would you use a journal entry. And you might have a transaction like you purchase equipment, for example, but you financed it. You didn't pay any cash. You financed the purchase of the equipment. In that case, that's not a normal transaction. You don't buy equipment all the time and you didn't hit cash with it. So you might have to record that with a journal entry. Journal entries are also used at the end of the period with adjusting entries. And we'll take a look at that possibly in a future section or course in the adjusting entry process. They're used deliberately there as a journal entry so that we can differentiate the fact that these are adjusting entries which are in the form of journal entries as opposed to the normal accounting process which is generally constructed with the use of one of the forms. The statements. Statements are going to be things that we can provide uh, generally if you have a full accrual accounting system. So you have invoices that you're sending out and then you're tracking the accounts receivable. So if they haven't paid you on the invoices, then you can send out the invoice again, but they might have multiple invoices that need to be sent out, or you might want to periodically send out reminders kind of on an automatic basis. The statements help us to create statements that can be sent out uh, to customers to try to collect on our, our inventory. So it's, so it's not really recording any transaction, but it's something that we do on a periodic basis. And therefore that's why it's kind of in this plus button here. Inventory quantity adjustment. So this would only be in play if you're tracking inventory on a perpetual inventory system within QuickBooks. So whenever we talk about inventory, the question is, do I want to track inventory in QuickBooks on a perpetual inventory method or somewhere else, possibly tracking it in the Shopify store or Amazon or on an Excel worksheet and therefore use a periodic system possibly uh, for QuickBooks. If you're using a full perpetual system, then then you might have to do, you, you'll still want to do a physical count of the inventory and you might have shrinkage or stolen goods or something. You have, you have some punk kids and keep on stealing your inventory or something and you have to then write it down for the fact that uh, that it's been stolen or it's been spoiled or whatever whatever they did they threw they threw your inventory at your door and splatted it so now it's been splatted on your door for whatever for whatever reason that was for any case so then you get you have the pay down the credit card now the pay down the credit card is similar to the transfer form so in that case we have two bank to bank fee transactions, but instead of a bank, it's another financial type thing that's connected to the bank, the credit card, which is a liability. So the credit card then will have a similar issue with the with the transfer. We, we could, when we pay off the credit card, pay it with an expense form out of the checking account, right? But but it might look better if we use the the pay down with a credit card, or we could use a transfer form possibly to pay it down as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in, later, in, in later, although 
I, I think a lot of people still use the expense form to pay down the credit card because that's like a normal uh, thing to do. But the but the pay down with the credit card will give you another another uh, form to look on it, and you can see the same the same thing over here, the same problem. Like if I go into the credit card over here, we can see that we might use the expense form to actually uh, m record the charges. And then when I pay down the credit card, it's going to show an expense form to pay down the charge, right? Which 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 isn't exactly what we typically want. We would like to have it be another form to pay down, uh, so that it would be something different, so that we could sort by something different, which would be the pay down the credit card uh, form. So those are, so we'll go through some of these in more detail in future presentations.